Okay, all good morning, Monday morning. How are we feeling today? We've had some, uh, I guess, mostly cons the way we've heard it so far this morning. Anybody have anything good going on? Sore. Uh, hopefully from like working out or something that you've done on your own. I'll just, <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that one. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> Um, so let's see, the screen is shared. So the agenda today isn't too much. We're starting to get into some real material. And I think what that means is um, that the material is starting to be a little bit more abstract. So I'm gonna try to do some recaps as we go through the core of the material of this course. So today we'll just start with a recap and um, our recap is gonna be on probability. So I'll run through some of the more important parts and I hope that just kind of naturally devolves into a Q&A where you all are asking questions about things we've seen or making statements about things you've learned or you know what have you. Um, and then we'll do properties of probability there are just a few important properties that directly follow from the axioms, um, which we'll remind you about in the recap. And those are really good to know about. So we'll go through the properties and we will try to draw pictures as much as possible. And um, we'll probably only do a few uh, proof like things. So um, hopefully it'll be mostly picture-based and therefore somewhat intuitive. So are there any questions before we get started on, um, let's say our course notes or anything not directly related to probability? Or any LaTeX questions or R code questions or R markdown questions or course in general questions? When will the first lab uh, material be available? You said it would be coming pretty soon uh, in the last week. Yep, so my hope is um, to send out one email today that contains this week's lecture videos and um, the official announcement about the labs being posted. Um, I've been holding off on it over the weekend because A, I don't wanna email you all on the weekend. You're all supposed to have the weekends to yourself, more or less. Sometimes you got to do homework, but anyway, you know. Um, short answer today. Uh, longer answer is I'm going to try to pair it with the lecture videos that I release today, that I post today, um, and then announce to you all what's going on. Uh, the due dates for them are going to be as relaxed as the due dates for anything in this class, but of course I encourage you to jump on them sooner rather than later. And uh, they will consist of a range of problems from easy to fairly difficult. But as the, uh, as the problems get harder, I will be more lenient on grading. Um, I understand that probability seems uh, easy when all you have to do is like, you know, you're like, hey, what's the probability of flipping two coins in a row? And by the end of this week, you should be able to answer a question like that. But um, probability questions get really hard really quick. So I'm gonna try to be pretty lenient on the grading for the labs. Um, and we're gonna have them due at the end of the semester. And they are all going to be online web pages. They're essentially gonna be web pages. If you guys know like what a formal HTML form is, that's what these labs are going to be, just with math involved and answers that you submit through the web page. We won't be um, we won't be using web work then. No. Okay. No. Did I say we were? Oh no, but you said it would be oh. a web. Page. So I wasn't sure if you meant that oh, you had okay. a service that we were going to access, or if it was going to be like a an actual website, a web page that you produced yourself. That's awesome. I I see, you've just used web work in the past so you thought it might be similar. That's a great thought. I have looked into web work and I don't like it for my own personal reasons. So I've tried to roll my own this semester 
and I have been using it. I haven't been using it, but I've had um, literally thousands of students using it in uh, an, a freshman level course, a freshman little level stats course, but I have never tried it myself. I only kind of developed it for a friend and she has been trying it out a lot. And this is the first semester I've tried it out myself. So it's a little bit uh, new for me. So we'll see how it goes. Wow, that was an incredibly long answer to uh, the question, when are the labs available <laughs> today? <laughs> uh, other questions before we get going and then I'll start my recap. They're all like, no, don't ask him more questions. You'll get another five minute answer. So um, let's start out this recap with reminding ourselves that probability is actually a function. It's a set function that takes you from sets in the sample space to uh, the real numbers between zero and one. And probability defined over some set A is defined as an expectation of an integrator function on that set A. Well, let's see, we got a question in the chat that's directly related. Most of the recap is things we have already talked about, correct? And so most of the recap should already be in your course notes. You don't need to double up on information in your course notes. That's a correct idea there. The answer to the question is uh, most of this recap will already be in our course notes. Great question, thanks. Um, probability is a function that works on sets like the set A, which um, I guess we should say for A, a subset or equal to the set S. And it's defined as an expectation over an indicator function of that set. I think it's best to see that as a picture. At least that's what works for me. So I'm hoping it works for you all. So if you had a density function defined on the sample space, one, two, three, and four, and your set A, so this is like, um, let's let S equal the set one, two, three, and four, and A, whoops, be equal to two and three. I'm just kind of choosing arbitrarily. Then probability is going to be essentially this area, which reminds us that probability is, you all fill in the blank, area where? Under the curve. Under a density function, exactly. Probability is area under a density function. So expectation is our like generalization of area under a function and specifically a density function. Expectation generalizes area under a density function. If your density function is defined on a countable or finite set, then this expectation becomes a sum and we're just adding up the density function at the point, at the points defined on the set A. And if uh, the sample space is uncountable, then we get an integral out. 
So in this case, all we really had to do was add up f at 2 and f at 3, since our set A is just defined on the points 2 and 3. So probability is area under a density function contained within the argument. Probability is area under a density function for the points contained within the argument. OK? And we addressed three axioms of probability that were essentially like, when do you know you have a probability function? So long as the probability function applied to the entire sample space is equal to one, the probability of any subset of the sample space is bounded below by zero. And then this crazy one, which probably isn't super intuitive, not even yet in this class. If you have a bunch of subsets A, N, of the sample space and the a n are pairwise disjoint then you get this relationship which essentially just says if you're interested in the probability of the union of a bunch of sets and those sets do not overlap with each other then all you have to do is add up all of the individual probabilities Are we able to work? Okay, so here's a question from the chat. Are we able to work out some density functions in some examples to, fall, to solve some probability? So do you mean to say, if I told you guys there was like a gamma distribution and I asked you for the probability of some set relative to the gamma distribution, you want to be able to work out that probability? Aha. OK. This is an excellent question. And I'm going to show you all why we are not going to do those sorts of questions by hand. I'm going to rephrase the question. Oh, you didn't specifically ask for a, a continuous. Sorry, I, Jake, I interpreted your question as a continuous distribution, but you didn't necessarily ask for a continuous distribution. And I was answering for a continuous distribution. We're not going to do this for a continuous distribution. So I'm breaking your question into two parts. And I apologize for misinterpreting it at the get-go. So it'll just take a minute longer for me to get you maybe the answer you are after. OK. 
So I misinterpreted the question as asking specifically about a continuous distribution. I don't know why my brain went there, but it did. And that would essentially be like, if you had some continuous distribution that looks like this, maybe a gamma distribution, and then you had some set that was maybe an interval from A to B, could you calculate area under the curve? You absolutely could. Area under smooth curves are integrals. The only problem is integrals under the smooth curves that we are most interested in in the world of statistics are really nasty functions. And that's why I'm gonna say we could do an integral like this, but we won't. And um, I'm going to attempt to show us just by finding the Wikipedia page on the gamma distribution, why we are not going to do this. This right here is the density function for the gamma distribution. Is that big enough for everyone? The one labeled PDF is probability because people insist on putting the word probability everywhere, density function. And so the problem with trying to do probability problems under um, distributions defined on uncountable spaces is you would have to do an integral that looks like this. And I bet for most of us, we don't even know what this function is because it's absolutely horrendous. This function in the denominator is an integral itself. <laughs> okay, so I'm hoping that is a quick justification for why we will not do probability problems for continuous distributions. Can we do some probability problem for a discrete problem, for a discrete distribution? Yes, and that's going to be labs this week. We are going to focus this week on sets with so many elements that it's hard to understand how many numbers are in the sample space. And we're going to focus mainly on discrete, uniform distributions defined on sets with so many elements in the sample space that you actually have to do math to understand how many elements are in the sample space. We are going to work on this week probability problems where you have to use combinations or the multiplication rule to count the number of elements in the sample space or in subsets of the sample space. Okay, so I'll just add focus on discrete uniform. Okay, so let's jump into our properties of probability then. Oh, no, I didn't give you guys enough time to ask questions. Let me finish writing out this. title, and then I promised after the recap, we would give opportunities to ask more questions from things we've seen. So here's uh, the floor to you all. We had one question in the chat. It was great, even if I misinterpreted it. I'd appreciate some number more than one more questions. What else we got? Will we have to do probability problems for non-uniform distributions? Absolutely. The binomial distribution is going to come up um, quite a bit for us because it's a fairly easy one to work with. I think you can intuitively see what's going on. You can look at the plot. You can do the calculations in R fairly quickly. So yes, we will work with non-uniform distributions, uh, mostly the binomial. 
And then as the semester progresses, we will start um, approximating probability problems for non binomial and non uniform distributions. But I won't ask you to do the uh, calculations for like area under the curve by hand. Um, as the class progresses, I will show us how statisticians use data, because that's been a request in the class to emphasize data, how statisticians use data to approximate integrals. Okay, there's another question in the chat. Is the first axiom just a given statement since it will never equal anything different than one? Yes, this is just a statement of fact. You don't have a probability function if the probability of this, if the function applied to the sample space is anything different than one. This is like a requirement. You should almost think of it as a requirement. If your function applied to the entire sample space uh, is equal to one, then you may have a probability function. It would also have to fit the, these other two requirements. But if you have some set function applied to a sample space and it does not equal one, then you immediately don't have a probability function. Okay, some good questions. What else we got? Is everybody doing generally okay with probability as area under density functions? Um, I had a question on your uh, combinations on your R example. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know how best to help you. So let me maybe just pull up R Studio first. No, 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 it's not about the code. It was more like, how do you know in the uh, when we're going for two pairs in a random card that it goes thirteen choose two since we want there's uh, thirteen different cards we want a pair of two of them how do you know we go straight to eleven why don't we go to twelve at all like why do we skip twelve choose one oh when you do the thirteen choose two mm -hmm. you're essentially identifying two uh, up to two suits. Mm -hmm. No, two faces, sorry. You're uh, potentially identifying up to two faces. Say you identified um, twos, so you'd get two twos and fours, so you'd get two yeah. fours. Mm -hmm. Well, now you have two different faces. Yeah. It's and so how many up. faces are left? 11. 11. So that's why you skipped the 12. Okay. Okay. Yeah, great. Anybody else for questions? Okay, I'm gonna wait till it reads 1025 on my clock. That's less than a minute away. If I don't hear other questions by then, we'll move on. Are the videos doing it for you guys? Are they doing okay? Oh, Patrick, fantastic, thank you. Difference between density function and probability function. That's excellent. So density functions, yeah, let's just do that.
Okay, probability is a set function. So it's a function that takes sets as arguments. Density functions take numbers. So density functions are closer to functions you all have seen before um, from any of your calculus classes. Probability functions are new because we have probably in our world of mathematics never seen a function that takes a set before. Okay, then there's some differences in properties. Probability. Bounded above by one. That's what the first axiom of probability is telling us. There is no probabilities greater than one. We cannot have probabilities greater than one. So maybe it'll be helpful to like do a compare and contrast. Density, not bounded above by one. Okay, number two. Uh, so to be more explicit, density can be 110, 512, 1,439.2. Density can be any number bigger than one. It doesn't have to be bounded above by one. Probability is bounded below by zero. Density also bounded below by zero. Okay, those are the biggest differences between probability and density functions. The only last thing you should keep in mind is probability as a set function, which takes value as area under Um, density functions. So they certainly are related. Probability uh, is calculated from area under density functions, but they're theoretically different things going on because one acts on sets, the other does not. One is bounded above by one, the other is not. And indeed, both are bounded below by zero. Um, Patrick, how's that doing for differences? Great, thank you. There are some other comments uh, that I really appreciate. Of course, I uh, appreciate the positive feedback. Um, and I'm glad that this is working for those who are willing to speak up about it. I hope for those who weren't willing to speak up about it, that it is working for you. And if it's not, um, if you could let me know in some way, whether that's uh, email or Piazza or Discord or anonymously on our Google form, I would uh, try to better accommodate you in ways that I can. I think this class is just difficult for a number of reasons. It's like taking a bunch of math things we thought we knew and then putting them together in all new ways. So I can't do anything about this difficult. This class is difficult, but hopefully if there's some delivery aspect about it, I could help out. Okay, how about one more question? Or more than three affirmations that we don't need time for more questions. I'll take either of those. More than three people who want to move on or one more question. One, two, three. Thanks all.
Okay, assume you have some subset A of the sample space. It's pretty much how all of our properties are gonna start. Then the probability of A complement is equal to one minus the probability of A. And that's not so difficult to see once we get it in a picture. So if we have an entire sample space S and we know the probability of S is equal to one, you could almost think of this right here as the probability of the sample space. Then essentially all we're saying is that the probability, let's see, the probability of the complement, that's everything out here, is just equal to the probability of what's left over. And I'm trying to phrase that in the terms of a message in the chat. The probability of the complement, here, maybe I could do it like this to help us all. A is everything in the circle. A complement is everything outside of the circle. The probability of the complement is just what's left over in the sample space that is not in the complement. Another way to see that is by maybe rearranging this expression. If you just take the probability of the sample space, which is equal to one, we know that's also equal to the probability of A plus the probability of A complement. Those two pieces together give us the probability of the sample space, which we happen to know is equal to one. So all we're saying with this property is that you can find the probability of a complement by just taking one minus the probability of A. We have seen this before already. When we were talking about coins and possibly even an unfair coin, if you had a coin with a probability of flipping heads equal to P, whatever value it is between zero and one, let's just call it P, then the probability you flip heads is P and the probability you don't flip heads is one minus P. That is the probability of tails is equal to one minus the probability of heads. The probability of zero is equal to one minus the probability of one for a Bernoulli distribution with the probability of P. Maybe we should write that down so we have it. That one okay with everyone? Okay. Oh, okay. I got a request for an example with numbers instead of letters.
So if we had a Bernoulli distribution where the probability of A equal to the set that contains the integer one is one third, the probability that we observe a one is one third, then the probability of A complement, because it's a Bernoulli distribution, the complement of one is just zero. So in this case, the sample space is just zero and one. So here, the complement of one is just zero. And so the probability of observing a zero is just one minus P. That is essentially one minus the probability of A. All these extra symbols make things way harder. And sometimes when we see it in numbers, it, it gets back to easy. OK, thanks for the request to see it with numbers. This is going to be the hardest one to draw. Let A be the empty set. Then the probability of A is equal to 0. I don't know how to draw that one because I don't know how to draw the empty set. It's like, what do you do? I'm just going to do this just for fun. <laughs> I can't really put A down as a circle. Um, can't really put A down as a circle because my circles imply that there's something in it, even if I don't draw little points in it. So I don't know what to do for this one. Hopefully, it's just kind of intuitive. So that one was easy enough. OK, here's the next probability problem, uh, probability property. Let A be a strict subset less than B, where B is a subset of S. Then the probability of A is less than or equal to the probability of B. And this one is not so bad to see in a picture. If B is a bigger set than A, then the probability of B is going to bigger, be bigger than the probability of A. Let's say that again in slightly different words. If A is a smaller set, than B, then the probability of A is going to be probably smaller than the probability of B. And you can imagine that as just seeing the picture where A is a smaller set than B. And this isn't too bad to think through. Probability is area under non-negative functions. Probability is area under density functions. Correct. A is smaller because it is a strict subset. Probability is area under non-negative functions, basically positive functions. So if you take a bigger set under this positive function, then you're going to have more area than under a smaller set. So we might draw that out in terms of functions like this.
And hopefully that helps you see that probability of B is bigger than the probability of A. Okay. That one wasn't so bad. That one's almost silly. We know that the probability of the sample space is, or maybe this will help, the probability of the sample space is one. So any possible subset equal to or not is also going to be less than or equal to one. That one's not so bad, so I'm going to skip uh, any discussion on it. We're going to spend our most time on the last one. Suppose you have two subsets of the sample space A and B. Then the probability of their union is equal to the sum of the probabilities minus their intersection. This is what we're going to spend the next seven minutes on in this class, or however many minutes. Uh, we need. If you want the probability of a union, so that would be like here's A and here's B. And if you want this probability, then you should find it by adding together the probability of A to the probability of B and subtracting off the probability of their intersection. So it's a Venn diagram, yes. This is essentially just a Venn diagram. The only difference here, and I want to emphasize this, is that this is different than axiom three because axiom three is essentially the probability of two, of the union of two sets. And it looks like the sum of the probabilities, but there's, then there's an extra bit here. The difference between this final property and axiom three is that axiom three insists that these sets do not overlap. Axiom three insists that the sets do not overlap. And this property here does not say they overlap or that they don't overlap. It just says there's two sets. So let's give you all a quick uh, question. Why do we have to subtract off the probability of the intersection? Because if not, we're adding that little section twice, right? Perfect. If you don't subtract off the intersection, you're adding the intersection twice. Let's see if we can emphasize that. Here's A, and here's the part that overlaps with B. And if we add that to B, notice we are now counting that part that overlaps with A and B twice. So essentially what we're doing then is subtracting that area off once. How is my really terrible picture here? Does it capture the idea okay? It sure does for the one who knew why we subtract this off. What about the rest of us? Is this picture giving us an okay uh, description of the probability of the union of two sets? I believe so. You're subtracting it off because there's a duplicate when you merge them, right? Excellent. Just, just making sure. All right. 
Good. And then thanks for all the um, responses in the chat. Probability would be above one? No, that's the crazy part about this. The probability does not have to be above one here. So I think some quick examples might help us see that. So there's two ways this would work. Uh, there's a number of ways this could work. If you had A and B, then A union B is equal to A plus the probability of B minus the probability of what's their intersection equal to. We have a special name for the intersection in this case where the sets are pairwise disjoint. They do not overlap. It's the name of the set that the intersection is equal to? Would it be empty set? Perfect, thank you. And what's the probability of the empty set? Zero. Nice, that was one of our properties from before. So in this case, notice that A and B, even combined, are still less than the sample space. So it's not gonna be bigger than one in that case. Let's try another example. Oh, wait, I start with the picture first. That's the way my examples should go. What if we had complete subsets So in this case, what is their intersection equal to? Just the probability of A, right? Perfect. And since B is a subset of the sample space, this is not equal to one. So the only time we really need to concern ourselves with whether or not the sum is going to be bigger than one is this picture here. But I encourage you to think of A as a subset of the sample space and B as a subset of the sample space. Notice that when I shade everything in, this new set, which I will outline in orange, this new set, whatever you want to call it, is still a subset of the sample space. So the probability must be less than one. That was my best attempt at showing you graphically that the probabilities must be um, less than one. It won't ever be greater than one because A and B can't be bigger than the sample space. Correct. Great. Thanks for the feedback after I addressed your question. I appreciate that. Okay, all, it is 10.50. It literally just changed. I was hoping to let you out a minute early and then brag about it since I let us out uh, like two minutes late the last two weeks in a row. Thanks all. I'm gonna stop recording now, but I'll hang out for another five minutes if you have some additional questions. Otherwise, I will um, post the videos